Okay, we are back on Morning Line. Thanks for joining us. Professor John Vial is with us talking about the Republican convention. We've got Joe on line one. Let's take a call from Joe real quick, Professor. Joe, good morning to you. What's on your mind? Uh, just listening to uh, y'all uh, back and forth on this stuff. If, if the Republican Party is supposed to be the law and order uh, party, then what's going on right now in the United States and in the last four years, they sure have missed it some way or another. I mean, we have, we're having riots and killings and <clears throat> stuff every night or two. People are not obeying the COVID uh, rules that they set out for us, masks and things. And I hadn't seen Trump do, really do anything. He talks, he talks a good game, but he don't do very much. <laughs> and for, as far as Marsha Blackburn being an up-and-coming star, I ain't heard nothing out of her in the last year or two. <clears throat> the, the convention come up, but uh, I, don't have any, I don't have any faith in them, to be honest with you. The Democrats might not be able to do any better, but if they... Whoever gets in there, if Trump doesn't get elected, it's going to take them at least two terms to get this mess back on its feet and get it straightened out. He, he may be right about that. You, know, you talk about some of the various different issues and obviously the violence and things like that happening. You know, one thing, I think if there's one significant issue that affects us all, and we all know this, we've talked about this before, is the coronavirus, all right? And from what I've watched, as far as I could tell, especially from last night, the only person who really touched on it just really briefly was the vice president. Beyond that, you know, you get the sense that those involved with the convention now just want to maybe kind of gloss over it and give the impression that the coronavirus is behind us. And anyone who thinks it's behind us, I mean, them or anyone else is flat wrong. And I'm just wondering if that is something where, you know, they, they recognize that's a weak spot for the president. Why not address it head on and say, look, it's still an issue. We're dealing with it. And maybe the president will talk about it tonight. But I'm kind of surprised that we haven't heard more about that and what they're doing and the vaccines and all of that. It, the only other person who really brought it up at any significance was Melania, who, as we said, yeah. appeared to have gotten a prior clearance for it. One of the interesting things is, you know, you often look for body language. And I have, I don't know, we have seen candidates keep their distance in the Republican convention. and. The, most of the events that they publicize have been outdoors, but there's nary a, a mask among them. Right. Uh, and I think the Democrats really sort of made a point of, you know, making sure that there were masks on all, almost every occasion that they had. Uh, to, you know, to get back to what Joe says, you know, one of the complicating things, of course, about law and order is that most responsibility for these matters rests with state and local officials. And there has been wide variation. Uh, I don't know if the president has been particularly helpful on this issue or not. Uh, to some extent, he seems almost to have taken pleasure in keeping things sort of stirred up as a way of keeping this issue front and foremost uh, among Republicans. Right. And I think it's something that resonates with a lot of them. And, and some of it from the outside looking in, it almost can sound sometimes like scare tactics to get your attention. You know, they did have um, that couple that had the guns out to protect themselves when there was the, uh, was it in Louisville, was that again? Uh, that couple, they, I forget their names. Uh, no, it was, it was St. Louis. That's right, St. Um, Louis. And they, they actually spoke. They spoke at this. I heard on this. The, the best comment I heard on this was for a suburban family. They, they looked like they were living in Downton Abbey. It was a... <laughs> <laughs> More than a million dollar place they were defending at the time. Yeah, it looked like a very nice house. But anyway, they're out there and, they, you know, you have a right to defend your, your home. And then, uh, you know, um, Marsha Blackburn, of course, you know, is more than willing to attack. And uh, one of the things she said, if the Democrats had their way, they would keep you locked in your house until you become dependent on the government for anything. Now, I mean, that's a little over the top. <laughs> You know, I hear what she's driving at, but anyone where that's like, really? I mean, I'm, come on. Um, but that's, that's well, kind of the direction they're going. And you can take it back a bit, but just say 
that Republicans are trying to sell themselves off as more law and order. Yes, yes. And I, I guess, you know, in the face of some of these protests, but I do wonder if they're trying to appeal to, you know, some say the African-American voter to some degree, um, law and order, and then attacking, you know, these protests that are going on. Certainly no one likes the ones that turn violent, um, you know, and, and defending some of these cases where you have video that looks very disturbing involving law enforcement. I don't know how that actually is going to play big picture unless they've pretty much given up any hope of trying to attack, attract much of an African-American vote. Well, again, you know, one of their targets, one of the areas that Republicans seem weak right now, they do a lot better among white males than they do among females, uh, better among white females and black females. But, you know, you do sort of associate women often and men, but w with the protection of home and hearth. And, you know, if you can convince people that home and hearth are, in fact, you know, in jeopardy, that could be an effective fear tactic. Doesn't necessarily mean it's particularly accurate. Have you paid attention at all to some of the various different types of polls that have come out to, to any degree? Yeah. What 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 do you see? What's the you know, is there consensus to one or the other? And and again, I, I've long since stopped putting much stock into polls, but I, I think you can get a little bit of insight early on, and certainly the candidates pay attention to them. So one, one of the more interesting, and I know our provo, uh, Dr. Burns, uh, has done some research on co political conventions. Now, again, this is a very weird year because it's the first year since the 1830s where we haven't had a convention in person, but almost always a convention gives a bump to the candidate who was just nominated. And we saw that last, uh, last week, it looked like a two or three percent bump, and I would expect something similar sure. uh, to happen with Trump. The the best polls are generally the polls that either you know that are sort of averages or that give you direction. And the the average is about a eight eight point difference right now between you know with Biden leading. Uh, probably more interesting are the polls in the so-called swing states, and they seem, you know, much, much closer. So, you know, states like Pennsylvania and, and Wisconsin, uh, Minnesota, states that uh, in some cases, you know, Trump was able to win uh, for the first time for Republicans in, in many elections, they're probably really the ones to watch. Uh, my guess would be that as the election, you know, comes closer, there will probably be less, you know, less, not quite the eight to 10% that you're seeing right now. But, you know, as I've stressed many times, and as I know you agree, the only poll that really counts is a poll that takes place on election day. Yeah. And in this year, maybe, and the month before, <laughs> with early voting and uh, absentee balloting and the like. I, I couldn't agree more. Let's take a call from Ann. Ann, good morning. Hi, Ann. Good morning. Good morning, go ahead. Uh, in listening from my home here, I am a Republican, and I hear a lot of left-leaning in this show. But let me say, first of all, the Hatch Act and using the White House, if you go back and look, there was an incredible precedent for doing that. It was Franklin Roosevelt's fireside chats. He indicated, and I did a lot of reading on this yesterday, that the newspapers were pretty much Republican-led, which is interesting in this day. And so he was trying to get his message out. They were his opponents. So from the White House diplomatic room, he spoke some 30 times, and he said it was a political move. And then second, I believe the professor said something about Mrs. Trump having largely plagiarized her 2016 speech from Michelle Obama. Again, I looked back at that. There were two small passages. With all due respect, Professor, she did not plagiarize her speech in, in large measure. And then the other comment that you just made um, about the fact that Trump seemed to be stirring up this violence, I wish you'd rethink that statement. He didn't, the, the mayors of the cities we're talking about, Seattle, Portland, Detroit, they're all Democrat mayors. This is their job, and they handled it. He didn't stir anything up. He didn't cause people to attack the police, demean the police, call them names, throw them vile things. 
So I guess what I'm thinking is if you're going to analyze the convention, Mr. Barris, could you please have a little bit of balance? Well, sure. And listen, we've talked about both. We did the Democrat last week and we're doing this. But um, I think you, you can't ignore the fact that some have made the argument, and you are correct, that in these cities, that was happening before the president became involved. But most of the cities have indisputably said him sending in the National Guard made things worse, not better. That was only one city, and that was Portland. Uh, well, uh, the others, I don't, I don't know of any of the cities that wanted the National Guard there. Do you? I don't, I don't they, know any of the cities ask, that were any, asked. Did any I know of them Wisconsin, ask for it? I know Wisconsin has said, please help us. They did. But Portland, he sent them in for, what, a week? No, it's longer than that. Asked. It's longer than that. It's much longer but, than that. All right, so we'll go ahead, uh, Professor. You know, she makes a good point, I think, perhaps, about yeah, the fireside chats. But I, I think the distinction I was trying to make, and I apologize if, if I didn't come across clearly, the, it's, it's not uncommon at all for presidents to give speeches from the White House. I don't know of another occasion where they did a convention from the White House. Obviously, this is a little bit different because it's not being held in person, but that was a distinction I was trying to make. In terms of Michelle, uh, uh, in terms of the plagiarizing, I should certainly add the qualification that I'm not positive that Michelle, I, I think the plagiarism was actually a little more extensive than Ann believes that it was. But I'm not sure that Michelle herself knew that it was plagiarized. Uh, so I'm not necessarily casting personal aspersions on her. In terms of the, the violence, um, perhaps I overstated that. I, again, I did say that most of the violent, you know, most of the responsibility is at the state and local level. There have been some Democratic mayors, and I'm thinking particularly of Mayor Bottoms in Atlanta, who have given a strong denunciation of violence uh, as the president or anyone else has. Uh, I personally do not favor the kind of what I think is over, uh, under, sort of underestimating the threat in Portland, Oregon. I don't believe you can turn portions of your city uh, over to you, you know, to, to private individuals. Um, on the other hand, I think I, I stand by thinking that some of the actions that the president took, especially those that were not requested by the mayors themselves, actually kept the crises going longer than it probably otherwise would have. I think they're still though, making the, uh, the statement, though, and the president continues to call for some of these cities to put in the requests for that, or that he's saying that he still will continue to send that in. And I, I imagine he believes people, like Ann and others, think that that's the way to do it, to quell some of this down if we continue to see some of these violence. And, and it's escalating again now after what most recently happened in Wisconsin. You know, I think, frankly, one way of quelling some of the violence, you know, I don't know why we can't do two things at once, you know, walk and chew gum. I think we ought to be able to say that there are some problems with policing and that we had some fairly, you know, extraordinary examples of individuals who appear to have been, you know, killed, uh, Floyd most notably, who should not have been, and still say, like Reverend Dr. King, you know, used to say, that there's a difference between nonviolent protests uh, and people throwing firebombs. Uh, you know, in our own state, we don't seem to be able to make a distinction between somebody uh, burning down a courthouse or attempting to burn down a courthouse and somebody chalking a sidewalk. Uh, and I think they're, you know, radically different actions. On that note, let's take a quick break. We've got more phone calls in our final segment with our guest, Professor Vile, right after this. Stay with us.